amen. Let's give a hand to the Lord, amen. You know, in Genesis chapter 16, we're going to stay here, the musicians. I'm just going to share a short, short little thought. But we see one of the names of God. The name of God is El in Hebrew. It means God. And then when you add Shaddai, it means Almighty God, or El Elyon, or Elohim, you know? And you've heard these names. But they express part of what God does and who he is, and it's very exciting. But one of his names is El Roi. Everybody say El Roi. El Roi. And that means God. That means El means God. And it means the God who sees. The God who sees. And in Genesis chapter 16, Hagar was in a bad situation. Hagar was being mistreated. Today we would say uh, abused, you know. She was in a bad situation. But even in that situation, God wanted her to learn something. How many of you know that even in bad, ba out of bad things, good things can come out of them? And she had a bad attitude, too. Because she had a bad attitude, Sarah had cast her out. So she's in a situation of loneliness, of rejection, of being cast away. And she is in a desert. A desert is not a fun place to be. And there, the Bible says that she cried out to God. So even in that situation, she could cry. And she said, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child and shalt bear a son. She was pregnant too. And shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he shall be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord. That spoke to her. Thou God seest me. You see me. And I'm here to tell you today that God sees you. God sees you. All of you, God sees you. God sees you in your moments of loneliness, in your moments of desert, in your moments of maybe when you're being mistreated by somebody. God sees you. And Hagar, even in the midst of her rejection, she, she understood that. That's amazing because that's when you need to understand it. It's when you're feeling bad. It's when you're feeling low. She understood it when she was alone, when she was driven out, and when she was desperate, when she was in that wilderness. And the last thing that happens is that she says, you're the God that sees, but you're so close when you see me that you can also hear me. God is the God that sees you, but he also hears you. Don't doubt it for a moment. Amen. Let's lift up our hands. And we could say, you are good, Lord. You are good in every situation. Thank you, Father God. You are good. Amen. You see me and you hear me. When you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good. Every situation.
hear us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me take your seats this morning. Welcome to Living Hope. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Wednesday night Bible study. Join us as we go deeper into the word and hear a new refreshing word of life with Pastor Joe. Wednesdays online at 7 p.m. on our Facebook and YouTube page. Arise and make a difference. Join us for morning prayer every Saturday at 9 a.m. For more information about any of our events, please call us at 713-991-5683. His whole vision for Israel was for Jews to come here, feel like it's a safe haven. What he want to say is thank Straight. Very different from my political views, but I think he was one of the greatest leaders that Israel had. Menachem Begin believed in the need for the Jews to seize their future. Begin was very much a survivor. Never again there won't be another Holocaust in the history of the Jewish people. He was described as being anti-democratic, but he proved to be the most democratic of all. He had faith in his convictions and a very clear view of the way that things are supposed to go. He was a hero for all the Jewish Ethiopian community. No more war. He had the credibility to make the first peace with an Arab nation. He was a man of profound contradictions. Both sides were engaged in an existential fight. Israel has nothing to apologize for. Menachem Begin, with all his faults, belonged to a different class of leader. Rise, struggle, and guarantee the prospect of living in peace for your children and their children. Good morning, good morning. What you just watched right now is a, a trailer of a movie that we're going to be showing here at Guff Metal, I'm sorry, at Living Hope Church, and it's going to be on September 13. It's an incredible story of the former Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and he has a very powerful uh, story that we can learn. If you're into history, I encourage you to invite your friends from high school, from college. It's very interesting to learn from the past, amen, so we don't repeat uh, errors or we learn so much and it has to do with God's people Israel so I don't know about you but I want to invite people to come register at the lobby there is a QR code that you can just take a picture of it and sign up and it's going to be again 7 30 September 13 here at the church we would like to welcome all the people that are visiting here for the first time if you're visiting here for the first time can you raise up your hand we want to say welcome raise up your hand don't be shy i know who you are <laughs> welcome right here in the front we want to welcome you on the behalf of pastors joe and pastor becky keenan also uh on august 27th and 28th which is next week we have special speakers apostles ralph and donald holland they're going to be sharing with us they're people that have built up churches in many countries they have a testimony to tell i encourage you to invite someone to hear them out uh, and also um for Kids Quest, we are enrolling children from ages 2 to 12. If you have any children that you know of, please sign them up in the 
uh, in the lobby. And last but not least, don't forget our Pastor Becky is having her birthday next month. And, uh, you know, be kind, be generous. Let's honor her. There are love offerings up there in the lobby if you would like to uh, share or write a check or cash to Rebecca Keenan. And, you know, I just encourage you, let's honor the servants of God. Amen. And those are all the announcements that we have for today. On our next segment, we have something very special. Amen. You ready? We have a special segment called What's in Your Backpack? If you notice, uh, some of us are wearing some backpacks. I don't know if you got to notice that. Uh, so in the next segment, it's going to be about that. Uh, are you ready for that? Amen. Okay, here we go. What's in your backpack? Wow. Today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. I am so excited. Last week, I signed up to uh, I signed up to volunteer, and today I was chosen to sign more people up to volunteer. Hi there. Would you like to sign up to volunteer in the church? I'm, I'm okay, thank you. I'm not really good with kids, and I, I kind of hate cleaning. Oh, no, but come here, come here. I want to tell you something. Remember this. There's always a place for everyone in our church. By the okay. way, why do you have that backpack? It's just some stuff. Nothing nothing too special. Can I see? Sure. Oh, a microphone. Do you like singing? You know, I... Every Friday, I go down to the little karaoke place down the street and just sing my heart out. Oh, ah, well, just you so know, right. with that voice, you can definitely honor God by joining the praise and worship team here in our church. Okay. Yeah, you should speak to our worship leader today. Yeah, okay. Awesome. What else do you have? Uh, let's see. Ooh, bamboo plant. How pretty. Did you do this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually really good at uh, at planting stuff, and I love tomatoes and papayas and oh. making little garden stuff here. Well, I see you have a green thumb. Yeah. Well, you know, you can definitely join our church landscaping team. Can really? you imagine making the house of God beautiful from the outside? You could be part of that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that, but okay. Definitely. What else do you have in there? This is Wendy. Wendy. My Windows computer. Oh, you put a name on it? I go everywhere with her. Oh, what does she yeah, do? I do or? I do all sorts of documents on it. You know, I just I do casual stuff like edit photos on Photoshop and mm. and Adobe Premiere and different movies. You know, I just make little movies here and there. Wow. Well, you know, mm -hmm. I think that you and Wendy can definitely join the multimedia team. You can definitely help the church social media. Imagine this, you touching, uh, reaching and touching thousands of people with the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. Wow, I never really thought about it. Using the little things that I like to do at home and little things that I do here and there for to reach people. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, where do I sign up? Well, here you go. Fill this out. I see another young person with a backpack. Hey, excuse me. Hello. <laughs> well, that was that one. Oh, I see another one over here with a backpack. I wonder what he has. Well, this month we're focusing on serving God. Amen? God has given each of us gifts and talents so that we can serve God and bless the church. Amen? The Bible says, always give yourself fully, fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen? Maybe, maybe you love to cook, or maybe you're great at marketing. I don't know. Maybe you're great at graphic design, or visual media, or communicating, or maybe you're good in landscaping. Whatever Whatever your talent is that God has given you, remember that the important thing is that you serve God with it. Amen? 
So what's in your backpack? Amen. God bless. Awesome. And now for episode two, what's in your wallet and purse? Just kidding. <laughs> God bless y'all. It's an awesome day to be here and just, you know, learning about God and getting connected through this little skit that, that was presented. You know, it's an awesome way to just get connected in what God is doing and what God wants to do through us. So this morning, we're going to start off, uh, before we start, if you need an offering envelope, there where you are, just raise your hand and they'll make one available to you. And then as we go into the song, you can bring it and deposit it here in the buckets in the front. We're going to start off in Matthew 6, 33, uh, 6, I'm sorry, 31 through 36. It says, don't worry then saying, what are we to eat? And what are we to drink? And what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, they seek these things, but God knows all the things that you need. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be provided to you. In other words, God is just saying, you know what? Don't worry about the material things. I know you need those things. I know you need to eat. I know you need to clothe yourself. You know, I, I know everything about you. And that's awesome when God, the king of kings and the Lord of the universe who created the heavens and the earth, just comes down and pinpoints each one of us individually and says, I know exactly what you need means that he cares, and he knows, and he is ready and willing and available to meet those needs that we have. And then it goes on, and as we look in Luke chapter 5, we see the story of Simon Peter the fisherman. And towards the end of the story, here is Jesus, and he looks at Peter and he says, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Verse 5, Simon responded and said, Master, we've worked all night, and we haven't caught a thing. But I'll do just as you said, just because you're telling me to do this. And when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish and their nets began to tear. So then P Simon Peter, he signals his partners and the other boat to help him to catch all the fish because their boats had so many fish in them that they started to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell to his knees and Jesus saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. In other words, he was saying, you know, we know that sin is missing the mark. He was saying, Jesus, I've missed the mark. But he was amazed. And, 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 you know, his companions were amazed. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, Simon, do not fear. You know, one of the things the enemy would try to uh, make us focus on is fear. You know, fear of if I do this, if I, if I trust God, if I give, if I'm faithful continually, what's going to happen in this situation or that situation? And the first thing that Jesus tells him is do not fear because from now on you're going to be catching people. He was changing his destiny, his path. So first of all, I want us to see that here he was obedient to Jesus. And he throws the nets back into the water despite knowing that, you know, he'd been fishing all night long. The Bible says that we should not lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledge him, trust him, and he will direct your path. You know, that's awesome because, you know, he's always going to direct you in the right path, the path of blessing, the, the path of his favor upon your life, the path where, where he's going to meet your needs, where he gets to meet and connect with you and bring that peace into your heart. You know, as we trust God in our finances with giving, you know, our tithes and our offerings, just like here, Peter, he says, do not be afraid. And so he goes on, and he's trusting God. But then the unexpected happens, right? He catches all these fish, and it's so much fish that he needs help catching these fish and bringing them ashore. And, and you know, that's awesome because that's the type of God that we serve. You know, in 2 Timothy, it says that we are vessels of honor. We're sanctified to do good works. And I love this part because he needed help. In other words, the blessing that came upon his life was just not for him. It was for those around him, for his family, for his community. You know, when God blesses us, it's so that we can be a blessing. That's why he calls us vessels of honor. What is a vessel? I mean, a vessel is filled, right? And if you keep filling that vessel, what happens? It overfills and it begins to pour out all around you. But with God, the awesome thing is as we pour ourselves out, as we empty ourselves with our talents, our abilities, our resources, and we trust God and we're walking with him, we're being sensitive to his voice, he continues to refill us. 
And I love that part because I know that when God refills us, and he refills us with his power, with his anointing, with his favor, with his glory, with his provision, then here he is, and he says, you know, I, I didn't expect to catch so much fish, but he was trusting God, and he was standing on his promises. And when we do that, God will provide and meet our needs. And then lastly, Peter, he's like, man, Jesus, I'm a sinful man. In other words, I missed the mark. I, I keep missing the mark, and I didn't realize that Jesus until right now when you showed me what you can do in my life. See, when we take that step of faith and trust God with our finances and say, Lord, I'm going to be faithful in my tithing and my offering. You know, just like Jesus showed Pete, Simon Peter, he says, Peter, look, go out into the deep. Trust me. And this is what I can do. When he saw that, then he said, now, Peter, I'm going to change your destiny and your purpose. And I don't want you to worry about the material things. I just want you to worry about honoring me and blessing me and place and doing what, what I have uh, done in your life so that you can do the great things that I've called you for. And I think that's the word that we can take into our lives and trust God with. And finally, as we're trusting God, we're believing him. You know, he had a purpose. He had a plan. And in that same way, God has a purpose in our plan in our lives as we trust him and we walk with him. So this morning, let's stand to our feet as we prepare our hearts, as, as we give our tithes and our offering. Let's say, God, I want to be that vessel that overflows with your blessing. I want to stand on your promises, believing and knowing that you are with me and not against me. And I am going to trust you and believe you. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We choose to be vessels of honor for every good work. We want to overflow with the blessings that you place in our lives. And Father, you know our lives. You know our hearts. You know our homes. You know our needs. You know everything about us, Father. So this morning in faith, we just place our trust in you, and we make a decision to be a blessing to the church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. One thing we ask of you. One thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. One thing we ask of you, one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. Arise, 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 take your place, be enthroned on our praise, arise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing, arise, arise, take your place, be enthroned. On our praise arise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing around. Lord, arise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him glory. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You can all be seated. God bless you all today in Jesus' name. I want you to open up your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. And I want to start reading from verse 2. Matthew 11 from verse 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and he said unto him, Art thou he 
that should come, or do we look for another? So at this point in John's ministry, he was wondering if Jesus was indeed the Christ. And, of course, he was in prison at this time because he was speaking out against uh, Herod, who had the wife of his brother, was living with her and all kinds of uh, wrongdoings and whatnot, and they had him in prison. And so he sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus if he was indeed the Messiah. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Wow. So when they came to Jesus and they asked him, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Well, Jesus could have very easily took the scriptures and went into all the prophetic words about the coming Messiah. He could have looked at, uh, for example, uh, the Messiah, it says in the scriptures, comes out of Bethlehem. He could show how he was born in Bethlehem. Uh, Isaiah says, uh, uh, a virgin shall give birth. He could have talked about the virgin birth that is in the scriptures. And he could have, he could have gone through all of the prophetic scriptures that he was fulfilling. But that's not what he did. What did he do? He said, I want you to go tell him that the blind see, right? The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So what he began to talk about was the manifestation of, of the power of the kingdom of God bringing deliverance and healing and salvation into people's lives. He didn't get into a religious argument. And how often we try to convince somebody about the gospel and we get into a religious fight or a religious argument. I was sharing with some yesterday how I was the first person in my home to get saved. And I was about 21 years old, and uh, I was raised all my life as a Catholic, and I would light candles and things, and and uh, I went to Catholic school, and but I didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord. And as I got older, I just felt empty inside, and I knew I needed God, and I really didn't know very much about Him. I don't even think I had a Bible. And I met Christians that talked about receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and being born again. And I, I heard them, and I received the Word, and I received Christ as my personal Savior, and my life was set free. I was delivered. I was changed. I was born again by the power of God. And I remember going home to my mother and saying, Mom, Mom, I, I've been born again. I've, I've received Jesus in my life. And she, she took her cigarette out of her mouth, and she looked at me, and she says, oh, my God, my son has become a Jehovah Witness. Because <laughs> growing up, you were either Catholic or you were in some weird group, you know. It was, there was no in-between. And so that began my religious war because every morning I'd come home from work and I would fight with my mother, and we would fight about this and we'd fight about that, and we, by, the, by the time we get finished, we'd be upset with one another, and, uh, and I'm fighting her, with her, and she's fighting with me. But one day, the power of God fell in our house. The presence of God, the power of the Holy Spirit fell in our house, and you could feel him. You could sense him. And when the power of God showed up in the house, there was no more arguments. There was only the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And my mother received Jesus as her personal Savior. Come on, somebody give him praise today. So Jesus is talking about the supernatural power of God. And what, what, what the Lord has just put upon my heart is we've got to come back to the place 
where we expect miracles, where we expect the unexpected. We expect God to show up and do amazing things. Now, I've seen the supernatural. We've experienced it. Some of you have. We have uh, Brother Reed. He's not here today, but he's usually here on Sunday, and he might have had to work. But uh, Brother Reed is an amazing brother. I love Brother Reed. And, you know, he'll come up here, and he'll be dancing up here at the altar. Praise God. I wish we all could dance before the Lord, you know. And he'll be dancing before the Lord. Well, he works as a, a security guard in one of those uh, kidney dialysis centers. And uh, he was there, and there was a man there, a, a Muslim man, and he was talking to that Muslim man. He was blind. The man was blind. And Brother Reed said, you know, if I pray for you in the name of Jesus, God can do a miracle in your life. And the man said, and he said to the man, what would you like? He said, I'd, I'd love to have my sight back. And Brother Reed prayed for the man. The next day, it was a couple of days, I don't remember exactly, but he came and the man's eyes were open and he was able to see and he was giving glory, glory, glory to God. I'm telling you, God is able. I've seen deaf ears opened up. We there have been people in our in our service who couldn't hear, or they, they had one ear that was from birth that couldn't hear. And I, in the service, nobody even prayed for them. Boom, the ear just opened right up. And so I've seen these things. I've seen cripples walk. We've seen miracles and things of that nature. But God wants to take it to a whole nother level where it's not some, you know, thing that happened 10 years ago or five years ago. But each and every one of us, we're walking in the supernatural. We're praying for friends and relatives and, and we're seeing God do amazing things in their lives. God wants to bring us to that place. And so when Jesus was explaining to John that he was the Messiah, he used the manifestation of the power of God. I'm going to tell you something. You can argue with scriptures. You can argue about religion. But when God shows up and does a miracle, he shuts every mouth. And there's no longer an argument. And so we need to see. We are a spirit-filled church. We are Holy Ghost people who need to be walking in the power of God and seeing the power of the kingdom manifested on a daily basis. And so I want you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. And Jesus, when he began his ministry... He was fasting for 40 days and nights, tempted by the devil. When he came out of the wilderness, the Bible says he came out in the power of the Spirit. And the first place he went to was Capernaum. And he did some miracles there at Capernaum. And then went up to Nazareth, where he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he opened up the Scriptures and began to read in the book of Isaiah where it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to open the blind eyes, set captive the prisoners, you know, all these things that we're talking about. And then he says, in your eyes this day, this scripture is fulfilled. And then he starts talking to them about two miracles in the Old Testament. The miracle of the widow who was starving to death when Elijah went there, there was a famine for three and a half years that hadn't rained. And you remember the miracle that, that uh, Isaiah, um, Elijah came and said, uh, go ahead and make me a little cake, all right? And then after you make me a cake, the meal in your bowl shall never fail, the oil shall never fail. And God did a miracle of multiplication. It was an amazing thing. And she obeyed that, even though it seemed crazy. And then there was the miracle of Naaman the leper. Naaman the leper. And it was also another miracle. And so Jesus told the people that were listening to him those two miracles. And they began to get angry because he said there were many people that were starving in the days of that widow, but they didn't have a miracle. And there were many lepers in the day of Naaman, but they didn't get healed. 
And what he was saying to them is this, that unless you learn to trust and obey even the foolish things of God, you will never see the glory of God. If you stumble over humanity and the natural, you'll never see it. Because you know what they were saying there at Nazareth? Nazareth was where Jesus grew up. And they were saying, well, we, we know his father and we know his mother and we remember him playing in the streets as a young boy growing up. I mean, what, what is this? You know, who does he think he is? And, and they were stumbling over his humanity and they could not see the anointing and the divinity that was in him and they stumbled over their flesh and that's why they couldn't see any amazing miracles and so we've got to come to a place, my friends, where we believe God for the supernatural. We believe that what God did 2,000 years ago, he can do it today. And God will use each and every one of us. So he points us to the story of Naaman. So I want to share that story with you today. Look with me in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. And we'll read from verse 1, and it begins talking about Naaman. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and he was honorable. And because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And so the story begins with this amazing, powerful, honorable man. And with all of his wealth and all of his power and fame, he couldn't get delivered from his leprosy. Do you know that there are things in people's lives that money cannot change? There are things in people's lives that education, money, fame, power, all those things are not even a solution. We see it all the time in newspapers. We see, we read of a, a famous movie star that had money and fame and power, and then he, he ends his life because there was something in his life that he couldn't get free of. And yet the answer is as close as their heart. His name is Jesus. And he's able to heal. He's able to deliver. He's able, come on, somebody give him glory. He is the answer to the impossible situations. And all around us, there are people on every level of society with situations that they don't know what to do. Marriages that are failing. Um, sicknesses and diseases and all kinds of problems. And God wants us to become sensitive to the people around us because we have the answer. The answer, my friend, is Jesus. He is the God that can make a way where there is no way. Our God still moves. Hallelujah. And so here's this situation. Naaman is a leper. There's no solution. There's no healing. Now, Naaman, as the captain over their army, had taken their, their army and had gone on different campaigns. And during one campaign, they captured this young little girl, and they took her to Syria, and she became their maid in their home. She was probably only 13, 14 years old, and uh, she was there in the house, and she virtually, she had become a slave. She was captured. And uh, she's uh, there in the house working for the, the woman, the wife of Naaman. And she starts talking about the miracles of God. She starts talking about the God that she believes in, the supernatural miracles of God. And she says to her mistress, if my Lord, was in Israel at the prophet's home, I know that he could be healed and delivered from his leprosy. <laughs> the people were shocked because there was no cure for leprosy. 
And she listened to this little girl, and she goes and she tells Naaman what, what she said. Now, I want you to understand something. This is so important you get this. This girl was probably, like I said, 13 or 14 years old. She was probably taken from her home. Maybe her parents were killed. I don't know the whole background, but all I know is she was forcibly taken captive and taken to the land of Syria, and she could have just as easily just got all worked up about her own problems and been depressed and, oh, God, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Where is God? And she could have got into all, oh, my lions and tigers and all this problem, and if I can't pay my bills. And you know how you get all worked up about all your problems? and everything. Well, she put all of those things aside and she started ministering about the miraculous move of God, that there is a God that heals. There is a God that delivers. There is a God that saves. Come on, somebody. And, and we got to come to a place where we're not living our lives being overwhelmed by all of our problems. Because I think we're doing a little bit better than that 14-year-old girl. At least I ain't a slave somewhere, killed captive, you know, in some uh, Uyghur prison in China or something like that, making Nike tennis shoes. But uh, I, I, I am free, and I, I do. God is moving in my life. And I, I've got to start thinking outside of the box. And I've got to stop worrying about my problems and turn them over to God, and I've got to start doing what God wants me to do, and that's sharing the good news with those people all around me. And so she shared. Now, listen to this. You know, she could have said, you know, if I tell him to go to Israel, and he shows up over there at Elijah's house, and he don't get healed, he coming back for me, and I'm going to prison, Okay. She could have thought that way, but she didn't. She was speaking words of faith. It's an amazing thing. And I really believe another thing, too, is that she put aside all of her hurts and all of her own feelings, and I really believe she was moving with compassion. Because you know what? Even though she was in that home, and even though she was a servant, she could see the hurt and the hopelessness and the despair that was in their lives. And she started speaking into their darkness. I'm going to tell you, my friends, there are people all around you in the workplace, in your schools, your neighborhoods. They don't know what to do. And you don't have to be a flaming evangelist and kick open their door and throw a hundred tracks in there and shout and talk. You could just simply, just in a compassionate, respectful, and a meek way, say to them, could I pray for you? Just, just like that. Just real simple. God's bigger. God's God. You don't need to you know, shake them or you know make them fall or something like. You can just just pray for them. <laughs> I knew this one evangelist. If you didn't fall down, he's gonna make you fall down. How about that? <laughs> we don't need to be that way. We need to just simply believe in the authority and the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And you could just pray a simple little prayer over that person's life and watch what God will do. Come on, people. Watch what God will do. So this little girl, she shares with her mistress. The mistress tells Naaman. Naaman goes to the king and says, this is a little Hebrew girl, and she's telling me all these miracles that happened in Israel, and, and there's a prophet there, and I could get healed. And so the king said, wow, that's amazing. I'm going to send you to the king of Israel. So he, he, uh, Naaman goes to the king of Israel with his, his chariots, and the king of Israel says, how can I help you? He said, I've come. I need a miracle in my life, and I want you. I want somebody to lay hands on me and pray for me. And you know what the, the king of Israel did? The king of Israel ripped his gown, threw it on the floor, and said, what, what, what do you think I am? What do you think, I'm God or something? This guy's looking for a fight is what he's doing. He's looking for. He was so, had 
And sad to say so many Christians are like, well, what do you want me to do? I don't know. No, no, no. It's not you. It's God. God that does the work. All you got to do is be bold enough to step out in the name of Jesus and speak the word of God and then watch what God will do. And so Elijah the prophet heard about this and says to the king, hey, don't you worry. I got this. Send him over here to my house and we'll take care of business. Okay. Thank God there's some folk with faith. And so it, it, the the Naaman, you know, he he comes with his chariots and he goes to Elijah's uh, Elijah's house or tent, whatever he was living. Listen to this now. Elijah doesn't even come out. He doesn't get up. Doesn't come out and greet him. He sends his servant out, and he says, "Go tell Naaman to go jump in the river." Seven times. <laughs> so the servant says, man, are you sure? You, you, you got a little oil? I can sprinkle some oil on him or something? No, just go tell him. Go tell him to just go jump in, but not any river. I want him to jump in that muddy, dirty Jordan River. I want him to jump into that river seven times. He said, all right, all right, boss. So he goes out there and says, hey, Naaman. And who are you? I'm just a little servant. And uh, the man of God wants you to go jump in the river seven times. <laughs> he was furious. He was fear. He went into a rage. He thought, my God, I thought he was going to come and lay his hand on my head. <laughs> Blow on me, do something, you know, put a little oil, you know, stomp his foot seven times. But he go tell me to go jump in the lake, you know, go jump in the river seven times. And he was furious. Let me tell you something. The things of God, get this, the things of God are foolishness to this world. But to you and I who believe it is the power of Almighty God. Listen to this scripture. Let me read you this scripture in Corinthians. Listen to this scripture. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You've got to understand something. To the natural mind, the things of God, the things of the Spirit are foolishness. Have you ever started sharing about Jesus and you kind of felt like, like kind of foolish? <laughs> if you haven't, you, you haven't done it yet. I remember, I, I remember that I had a hard time sharing about Jesus to really successful big people. And I could witness to a homeless guy on the street all day. You know, I mean, what, what's a, he, he's been waiting for his, his quarter, so he ain't going anywhere. But, but when you, you got to people that were successful and, and educated, it was a little bit more difficult. So I said, you know what? I got to get it. I don't want to have that kind of fear and intimidation. I want to be bold as a lion for Jesus. So I was in a mall, and I looked for the most best dressed, looked for the most fancy businessman, and said, I'm going to go tell him about Jesus. And so I went up, excuse me, sir. He said, yes, how can I help you? I said, I just wanted to tell you Jesus loves you. And he can save you and change. He cursed me up one side and cursed me down the other side. Something in me died that day. But I got set free from the fear of man. Come on, somebody. Praise God. So sometimes we, we got to realize that people will think you're foolish. Have you ever been laughed at? at laughed at because of Jesus? I've been laughed at. I've been mocked. I've been ridiculed. I've been, I remember I was preaching in Washington, D.C., right there in the, the, the center of where all the monuments are, 
And this guy came up and he just mocked me and he just laughed at me and mocked. And then after he left, there was a, a, a man there who hung his head down and he received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You know, the Bible says if people malign you or laugh at you for Christ, great is your reward in heaven because the same way they mocked and ridiculed Jesus and all the prophets and great is your reward. It says rejoice and be glad for great is your reward. So the things of God can, can be looked upon as foolish to, to many people, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't share it. Now, here, the prophet tells Naaman, go jump in the river. And don't just jump in the river once. You go throw yourself in the river seven times. And he was furious. He thought, what, a, what do you think? I'm an idiot? I've got better rivers in Syria. I've got crystal clear rivers and springs. And he wants me to go jump in that dirty Jordan muddy river. How ridiculous. And then one of his men came up to him and said, Naaman, if he would have asked you, and I'm paraphrasing here, if he would have asked you for a million dollars, you would have gave him that million dollars. If he would have told you to climb the highest mountain and stand on it for one week naked, <laughs> you would have done it. But he just told you something simple, something little, something that this just is so simple. It's so, but your pride will not allow you to humble yourself and submit yourself to the word of the Lord. You see, listen to me. God was not interested in just healing his leprosy. God wanted to heal his heart. Because as a mighty man of valor, he probably had a huge ego, a huge pride. And for God to make this man whole. See, God is interested in not just healing you. with some, He wants to make you whole before God. Body, soul, and spirit. Come on, somebody. And so the process that the prophet told him was going to bring deliverance not just to his body but to his heart and the man says general can't you just obey that can't you just put that word in your life and so he thought about it a little bit he said all right but i don't want nobody looking at me okay <laughs> i want every eye closed you know when I throw myself naked there into the Jordan River. So he goes down to the Jordan River, and they say, come on, get in there. And he throws himself into the Jordan, probably got seaweed and all kind of, you know, leeches, who knows, you know, and throws himself a second time, throws himself a third time. Oh, God, help. throws himself a fourth time. Fifth time, maybe a fish comes up out of it. Four, uh, six times in the Jordan. And finally, at the seventh time, he comes up out of the water, and he is delivered. He is healed. He is saved. Come on, his heart. Not just his skin. See, we are concerned with our skin, but God's concerned with our heart. His heart was changed that day. Amazing miracle. I've told you, some of you, the testimony of a very famous general in Mexico. Very powerful, powerful man. This was probably in the 1950s. And his mother was a Pentecostal, spirit-filled Christian. And back in those days, churches, you know, there was just a very few. And it was only the poorest of the poor that ever went to a evangelical, a spirit-filled church. And his mother was a Christian, and she went to a church in a small little barrio. They had like a dirt floor, and they, they, they had planks with cinder blocks, you know, like wooden planks. And they would gather there and say, sit there, and they would worship. And she was always after her son to go to church with her. So I think it might have been Mother's Day, whatever it was. So he said, okay, Mom, I'm going to go to church with you. Now, he's a big general. I mean, he's a powerful, powerful, powerful man there in Mexico. 
So he, he's going to church with his mom on Mother's Day. And uh, the pastor sees him coming and is like, oh, my God. You know, this, this man is, you know, one of the most powerful men in Mexico. He's like, ah, woo, let's get a spot for him. So he goes and he starts dusting off one of the planks for the, 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 the general to sit. And he has to be a big, big guy. He has to bend down to get into this little, you know, this little cave of a place. And he goes and he sits down on the plank and the plank goes, woof, like, you know how that happened. He goes, woof, up in the air. He falls down in the dirt, and, and the pastor's like horrified. He gets in, starts brushing him. Oh, I'm sorry, my general. I'm, I'm just sorry. So I come, come over here. He sits up, boom, and that plank finally falls down into the dirt, and, and people are like, ah, we're all going to die. And they, they take him over to this other place, and he, he gets on. He, boom, he falls down in the dirt the third time. And on the third time, he got up with tears rolling down his eyes, and he received the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And he became an amazing defender of Christians in Mexico. That's a true story. So God is not just concerned with our flesh, but he's concerned with our heart. But listen to me. This miracle was so amazing that the, the Naaman, the general, comes back to uh, the prophet's house. And he said, my God, I, I'm healed. It was true. He said, can I give you gold? Can I, can I give you silver? Uh, whatever. I, I, I want to bless you because you were a blessing to me. And the prophet says, no, 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 I, I don't want any money. I don't want any offerings. I don't. I don't want you to give me anything. I don't. I just what uh, freely I have received and freely I give. Just take it. Just praise God. Give Him glory. Give Him. A, I think that was probably a bigger miracle than healing of the leprosy. Okay, boy, we need to see miracles like that. When's the last time you you heard a pastor say, "No, I don't. I don't need it. Don't don't give me no." That's a miracle right there. So the guy said, "I want to give you something. I, I got to give you something." He said, "No." He I said, "I I want you." To give glory to God. He is your healer. Come on, somebody. He is the one that gets the glory. So, so he says, listen to what he says to this amazing man of God. So here it was. He comes back. He's healed, right? And this is what he says, verse 15. And Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God, and they stood before him. And Naaman said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And so please accept a gift from your servant. But Elijah replied, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts and though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elijah refused. And Naaman said, all right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back to my home with me. And from now on, I will never again offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice to any other God except the Lord. Oof. He was saved. What was it that turned his heart to God? The miracle power of the Lord. And what I believe God is saying to his people today, we're living in a time where the forces of darkness are at work at, like never before. Do you know that since they changed Roe v. Wade, the abortion ruling the Supreme Court, that over 85 churches have been attacked, defaced, vandalized. We're living in a time where the powers of darkness are rising up like never before. But we, as the people of God, we need to arise. We need to come into the supernatural power of the Lord because you cannot Argue with the power of God. Somebody give him glory here today. And I want to send you forth today 
in your homes and families and businesses. And I want you to realize that you are carrying. You are a carrier of the kingdom. You are a carrier of Christ Jesus. And as you pray with meekness and respect, you will see God do amazing things. All right? All right, I'm going to close with a scripture from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 32. Here God is speaking to Daniel about the last days. I believe times in which we are living in right now. He's talking to him here in these scriptures about the Antichrist. Now, I don't believe the Antichrist is yet manifested, but the spirit of Antichrist is at work all over the world right now. And God needs to send his power, his glory into the church so that we can arise and manifest the kingdom of God. Listen to what he says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Those who do wickedly against the covenant... He shall corrupt with flattery. It's talking about the Antichrist. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Great exploits. In the New American Standard, it says people that know their God will display strength and take action. It is time for Christians to take action. It is time for us to step out in faith, be used by God. The power of the kingdom of God is in your life, and God wants to show off in a mighty way. Somebody praise him today. I want us all to stand. Can you imagine if every one of us began to step out in faith and minister to the needs of people around us. As I said, you might be a quiet person. You might be somewhat shy. But it's not a difficult thing just to tell somebody, I'd like to pray for you if you don't mind. I know a God who does miracles. And what he's done for others he can do for you. I just want to say a simple prayer over your life right now, and you'll be amazed at what God can do. I want us to gather here at the altar today because what I want us to do is I want us to ask God, God, I want to step out. I want to be used by you. If that little servant girl could be used by you to see a general, a general of the army of Syria healed and saved. How much more can you do? In a, you see, we don't have to take the person to Israel because we got a God that does house calls, house calls. He said, wherever you go, I will go, and I will confirm the word with signs and wonders. So let's worship God, and then I'm going to pray for you. Lord, let the anointing come on your lives. Let's, let's worship the Lord right now. Yes!
Yes. In the name of Jesus. Yes. Let's give him praise right now. Yes, Jesus. 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 I want to pray right now. And I want us to pray for boldness. Just as that little servant girl was bold to speak to those people. And God used her words to bring about a miracle of transformation. I'm going to pray right now, and I want you to pray with me. With a loud voice, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that I am a child of God. Your favor is on my life. You have given me authority in the name of Jesus, you said these signs shall follow them that believe. Father, in the name of Jesus, I drive out of my life all fear, all timidity in Jesus' name. And I ask you today for boldness authority and power and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Heaven come. Yes. King of Heaven, King of Heaven, yes, 
Jesus. King of heaven. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, may our eyes be open to the hurting people all around us. And may we learn to take steps of faith and speak your word with boldness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you all in Jesus' name.